Let's turn together to Revelation chapter 7, and this morning we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. This is uh, really part two of kind of a two-part uh, message, so uh, if you didn't hear last week's, I'll do my best to recap it here for you in a moment, but you really probably need to go back and, well, there's no probably, you need to go back and listen to it in order to really make sense of what's going on here. Revelation is an amazing book because it is a book that tells us that God fulfills his promises. It's why we are encouraged by it. This isn't a frightening book. This isn't made to, uh, some people worry that this book is so frightening. It, it makes me worried about what's going to happen to me. Uh, it's a book for encouragement and comfort. And so we come to Revelation 7, and I want to read to you verses 9 to 17. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and He will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your word is so encouraging and comforting to us. This day, may it strengthen our resolve to follow Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, so... As I told you, I want to give you a bit of a recap, all right? So Revelation 7 is an interlude. It's a pause in the narrative that's taking place in the story. So we find the first six of seven seals in chapter 6. Then we have this pause, and then in chapter 8, we're going to come back to the final seal. So what I want you to remember here, this is really important, when you look at chapter 7, Remember, it is not happening chronologically, meaning it's not happening, uh, the events of chapter 7 are not happening after the events of chapter 6. Last week I explained that Revelation is cyclical, it's not linear, and we call this recapitulation. What that means is the same events keep getting retold from a different angle as we go throughout the book you got to understand that or else you will keep thinking that the book is happening uh, as one long linear progression of events. So what John sees here in chapter 7 was happening in the midst of chapter 6, not after chapter 6. So let me try to illustrate that for you so you understand. All right? It's like a movie. All right? And what I mean when I say it's like a movie, imagine you're watching a movie and in the movie, they show you a battle taking place, and it shows at the bottom of the screen, 2 p.m., and the battle is happening somewhere on the other side of the world at 2 p.m., and then about the time that this soldier on the battlefield gets wounded, then suddenly the scene cuts to a woman standing in her kitchen cooking, and the time says 1.59 p.m., and suddenly she drops the knife and gets a sick feeling in her stomach. That event that happened happens prior to the event on the battlefield, but they're flashing back to show you what happened. That's what's taking place here in chapter 7. It's a recapitulation, and you're seeing the events in an order that are not chronological. So here, chapter 7, 
is taking place just prior to the opening of the sixth seal in chapter 6. John is simply seeing things from a different vantage point in chapter 7. So the, this interpretation and the narrative, remember, it serves a very important purpose because it answers a question that would have been very important to every one of the people in the seven churches in Asia who were John's original audience. Remember, prior to the fall of uh, Jerusalem in A.D. 70 and the generation following, there was no separation between Judaism and Christianity. Christianity was just seen as a part of Judaism. And so to think of it as being separate from Judaism or separate from the nation of Israel would have never crossed their mind. Jerusalem still played a key role in the life of the church. And that's why uh, in the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, what's happening there plays an important role in what's happening in the rest of the church throughout the rest of the world. So the question that every first century Christian would have been asking as these events are being prophesied about related to the downfall of Jerusalem is if Jerusalem falls then what's going to happen to the church because they saw the church as one big entity connected and so what's going to happen that's the question Revelation 7 is answering if Jerusalem falls what will happen to the church and so before moving on to opening the seventh seal this question gets answered. So in Revelation 7, 1 through 8, John sees a number of things. Let me walk you back through them. In verse 1, he sees four angels. They're standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. These four angels are holding back the fullness of God's judgment. And at this point, they're preventing the complete and total destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. That occurs with the opening of the sixth seal. Then in verse 2, he sees another angel. This one has the seal of the living God. And this angel commands the four angels in verse 3 not to destroy the land of Israel until all the servants of God are sealed or marked on their foreheads. And remember that's set against the backdrop of Ezekiel 9 in which God protected a remnant of very faithful people from the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And how he did this was, was he put a mark on their foreheads so that the faithful remnant was marked. They were not touched. That's the same thing that's happening here in Revelation 7. This time, God's protecting this faithful remnant uh, from the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And he does this by putting a mark or, notice, a seal on their foreheads. This authenticates them. They belong to God. And because they do, they are guaranteed that he will protect them physically when the sixth seal is opened. Then in verses 4 through 8, we learn the identity of this faithful remnant. Verse 4 says, it's 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then in verses 5 through 8, it tells us that the 144,000 are made up of 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And so these numbers are not literal numbers. We saw they were symbolic. They indicated that the number who were sealed was a very large number. Not only was it a large number, it was a complete number. A complete number of God's elect from, the, from every one of these 12 tribes. And we identified this faithful remnant of 144,000 as being Jewish Christians. In other words, they were ethnic Jews who believed Jesus was the Messiah and they were living at the time in the land of Israel. And that's why God had to protect them as the, Babylon, I mean, as the Romans came in and wiped out the land of Israel. So just prior to the opening of the sixth seal, God protects this number, this very large and complete number of Jewish Christians, ethnic Christian, ethnic Jews. And we saw that this was uh, once again something that correlates with the Olivet Discourse that Jesus gave to his followers in Matthew 24. And, and he told them in the, the parallel in Luke 21 that they were to flee to the mountains when they saw Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Now, we know from history that over a million Jews died in Jerusalem during the siege of the Romans. And we also know from history that there were no Christians who died in Jerusalem during that time. And the reason they didn't is because they had fled the city. 
And the reason they fled the city is because Jesus commanded them to, and they obeyed him and they did it. And so we saw a correlation between the marking of the 144,000 and what Jesus commanded them in the Olivet Discourse to do. So Revelation 6 ended with a question. Remember the question was, who can stand on the great day of the wrath of God and the Lamb? In other words, if Jerusalem falls on that day of wrath, what's going to happen to the church? And so chapter 7 then pauses the narrative, it backs up, and it shows us the answer. But the answer is, is that before Jerusalem fell, God intervened and he saved a faithful remnant of Jewish Christians, and they were from every tribe of the sons of, Israel's, uh, of Israel, and these Jewish Christians all made it out of the city safely. And so it was old Jerusalem that was destroyed, but the new Jerusalem was protected by God. This faithful remnant was part of something much, much, much bigger, and it was so big that it couldn't even be numbered. Now, that's where we pick up with verse 9. You say, that was fast. Well, last week it was an hour, okay? So that was the whole hour in that amount of time. Don't get your hopes up for the future, all right? Okay, let's start with verse 9. After this, I looked... And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now I want you to notice the progression of the vision. Verse 1, after this I saw. Verse 9, After this, I looked. And now notice that the location of what John is seeing has now changed. The location of verses 1 through 8 was on the earth. Specifically, it was where? In the land of Israel. But the location of verses 9 to 17 is now in heaven. It is now, we are told, before the throne of God. Those in verses 1 through 8 were in danger But those in verses 9 through 17 are no longer in danger because they're now with God. They are now in his presence. They are in heaven. That is where God dwells. So after John saw God's protection of the faithful remnant on earth that was made up of 144,000 Jewish Christians from one nation of 12 tribes, he then sees here a second group. This second group is in heaven. And this group is not made up of only ethnic Jews. It is made up of a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. So the first group of people that we see in verses 4 through 8 is very distinct in that it was comprised only of ethnic Jews who had pledged their allegiance to Jesus as the Messiah. But the second group in verse 9 is comprised of all tribes and peoples and languages from, look, every nation, which means that this group would include the 144,000 of the first group. This second group is the true Israel of God, full and complete from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. John is seeing here the fulfillment of God's covenant promises to Abraham. When God first came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, listen to what God said in Genesis 12 verses 2 and 3. He told Abraham, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that Oh, so there's a reason you're going to make my name great. Yes, what is it? Well, here it is. So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And now watch. And in you, Abraham, in you, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families. Not just Abraham's ethnic family, but all the families. So God's promise to Abraham from the very beginning was not limited to one family or one nation. 
Rather, the promise was given to Abraham for all families and all nations. It's through Abraham's descendants that this promise will be fulfilled. And then, in the next chapter, in Genesis chapter 13, in verse 16, God promised Abraham that he would make his offspring as the dust of the earth, which is a way of saying you won't be able to count how many there will be. In other words, his offspring would be a great multitude, Revelation 7, that no one could number. And that promise is repeated multiple times to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, comparing the number of their offspring to the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky, both of which are a great multitude that no one can number. Then in Genesis chapter 17, God promised Abraham that he would multiply him greatly and he would make him the father of a multitude of nations and that kings would come from him. The covenant promises of God to Abraham were never limited to one family or one nation. They were always intended to be fulfilled through a multitude of nations. And now in the New Testament, I want you to go ahead and turn with me to Galatians 3. In the New Testament, we see these promises that were made to Abraham fulfilled through the salvation of the Gentiles. So as the Apostle Paul clearly states in the New Testament, faith in Christ is what makes someone the spiritual offspring of Abraham. We see it in Romans 4. We see it in Galatians 3. We don't have time to look at Romans 4. We'll just look at Galatians 3. Look at verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Now mark that phrase. It is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. It doesn't say those of ethnic descent. It says those of faith are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, verse 8, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, the Gentiles preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and now he's going to quote Genesis 12, 3, which I read to you a moment ago. In you shall all the nations be blessed. Now look at verse 9. So then, because of that, so then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And now drop all the way down to the end of the chapter and look at how he closes this out with verse 29. And if, if you are Christ's, then, so we have an if then, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Now watch very carefully. If then, if you are Christ's, watch, how many of us who are Christians in this room this morning are of Christ? Well, every Christian, what it means to be a Christian is, is that you belong to Christ. So watch, if you, sitting right here in this room, regardless of your ethnic descent, belong to Christ, then, if then, you are, you, who might be the first one to say, well, I'm not Jewish, I'm not from Israel, but if you belong to Christ, there's the verse, then you are Abraham's offspring. See that? You are Abraham's offspring. What does that make you? That makes you the true Israel. You are Israel, heirs according to promise. Those who belong to Christ, the church, is the true Israel of God. And it is made up then of both Jews and Gentiles who, by faith in Christ, together make up the true Israel, heirs of all the promises made to Abraham. 
So, coming back to Revelation 7, John is seeing here the fulfillment of God's covenant promises to Abraham when he sees in heaven, verse 9, a great multitude uh, that no one could number. So that means that the promise of you will have descendants as much as the dust of the earth, the sands of the sea, the stars of the heavens. We can't count any of that. Here we go. Well, no one could number this multitude. It was from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Well, that's not surprising because that was all in the covenant promise God made. They were all standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and he sees that they are clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Now, their white robes symbolize here righteousness and purity. We've seen this throughout Revelation as we learn in verse 14 here. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So this isn't to be confused as they're having received white robes because they were martyrs. They didn't wash their robes in their own blood, but they washed them in the blood of the Lamb. And so it's being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We also have seen that white symbolizes victory in the ancient world. And throughout Revelation, Christ repeatedly exhorts his followers to overcome, to conquer all of the tribulations that they are facing and to be victorious in their trials. In Revelation 3, 5, Jesus promised the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments. And here, this great multitude before the throne is clothed in white robes in heaven. And the reason is because they were victorious in all their trials on earth. And so John also sees that they have palm branches in their hands. Now, of course, this makes us think of Palm Sunday, which is celebrated on the day in which we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the last week of his life. But uh, in fact, let me just tell you, the only other place in the New Testament that palm branches appear are in John's gospel. And John is the one writing the book of Revelation. In John 12, 13, he says this, uh, they took palm branches of palm trees and they went out to meet Jesus crying out Hosanna which means Lord save and ironically here what do we find we find palm branches and them crying out salvation belongs to our God they were saying in John blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord even the king of Israel but long before these palm branches were associated with Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry they were associated with the feast of booths B-O-O-T-H-S, in case you don't understand my Texan. Feast of Tabernacles, all right? The Feast of Booths, if in Leviticus 23, God commands Israel to observe certain feasts, sacred assemblies, and that there were three of them that required all Jewish uh, people to come to Jerusalem to observe. One of these was the Feast of Booths. And that feast commemorated God's deliverance of his people from Egypt and his providing safety and protection for them throughout their wandering in the wilderness on the way to the promised land. When they entered into the promised land, they had permanent dwelling places. But when they lived in the wilderness, they didn't have permanent dwelling places. Instead, they made makeshift temporary shelters wherever they would stop. And they would make them out of palm branches. And so the Feast of Booths was a feast in which Israel stopped everything they were doing and they made shelters out of palm branches and they lived in them for one week out of the year, every year, to commemorate and remember that God had delivered them. He had protected them. Glance down at verse number 15 and look at what it says there about this great multitude who has palm branches in their hands. They are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will look, shelter them with his presence. That word shelter is the same word used for booths in the Septuagint when referring to the Feast of Booths. And so there's an indication here that that's what's taking place. And furthermore, in the book of Zechariah, which as we know serves as a backdrop for so much of Revelation, there's a specific reference in Zechariah chapter 14 to the Feast of Booths that is made in connection to their keeping it at a time in which it is said that all nations 
will stream into Jerusalem. They will pour into Jerusalem along with all the families of the earth, and there and then they will worship the king who is the Lord of hosts. And so what we see here is once again this pointing to the universal fulfillment of God's covenant promises made to Abraham. We see it right here. This is a great multitude standing before the throne with palm branches, singing to the Lord, praising him because he has done what he said he would do and he has saved his people. John tells us in verse 10, they are crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That word salvation right there, it appears three times in Revelation. Here, and again in chapter 12, verse 10, and later in chapter 19, verse 1. And all three times, it is in praise to God, and all three times it is accompanied by the statement that it is being said with a loud voice. All three times. Let me spell that out for you. There is no half-hearted worship in heaven. There is no half-hearted worship. And there should be no half-hearted worship on earth either. You see, when we assemble for worship every Sunday on the Lord's Day, we are gathering to give praise to God because he saved us. You see, when we truly understand the holiness of God, who God is in all of his holiness and the immensity that we would have to find with our words to describe the purity and the magnificence of his holiness, when we truly comprehend that, you cannot but help simultaneously to comprehend the true depths of the filthiness and the sinfulness of humanity. When you stare and gaze long into the holy nature of God, you will not think highly of yourself. You will think very poorly of yourself. You will recognize in yourself the depths of your sin and your depravity that makes you unfit for the presence of a holy God. And so to admire him for his holiness requires and absolutely will bring about a reflection upon your sinfulness that will cause you to say, the only reason that I have any merit whatsoever before him is because I have the merit of Christ's righteousness given to me. And so I stand in his presence undeserving of this moment. I lift my voice in song to him undeserving of the privilege to be able to sing to him. I, as one singing to him of my own merit, should be rejected and thrown out. But because of what Christ has done for me, in dying for my sins on the cross, I lift my voice and praise to him. Not only am I worthy in this moment to do such a thing, but all of my singing should be reflective of the worthiness of the salvation that I possess. And so it should be full and loud and deep worship, not this sort of half-hearted worship. Full-hearted worship is both sincere as well as thunderous in its volume. And I'm not talking about the volume of speakers or the, the sound of instruments. I'm talking about the volume of the voices of the redeemed. Let me explain something to you. That guitar has never been saved from its sin. How dare it outplay us? That piano has never been redeemed from its rebellion against God, but you have. How dare it be louder than your voice? Those drums, as loud as they may be, have never once peered into the holy face of God 
contemplated their sins and then having been told that Christ died for them, been redeemed from such a thing, how dare they be louder than our voices? I think one of the greatest tragedies of the modern Christian worship industry is that we have allowed our voices to accompany the instruments when the voices of the people are the voices of those who are redeemed. The instruments should only accompany those voices and yet the voices should constantly outsound them. Is that how you sing? Is that the level of thunderous excitement in your voice when you say, yet not I, but Christ in me? If not, perhaps you need to sit quietly before God. Contemplate the depths of your depravity. Contemplate the seriousness of his wrath upon sin. Stare into the eyes of one who is holy and be reminded that he who created all things and spoke this world into existence with merely the words of his mouth not only created you, but redeemed you for an eternity spent before him. And maybe, just maybe, you will erupt in praise and worship to him. The voices of God's people should always be seen right here, a loud voice crying out, salvation belongs to our God. He sits on the throne. And here, a peasant such as me is invited in to his courts to praise him. Salvation belongs to the Lamb. The only one worthy in the universe to open the seals and fulfill God's purposes. And yet, the worthy one died for me. And I washed my robes in his blood and am saved. Is that how our voices sound? That's how they should sound. This great multitude of the redeemed sets a standard and we see it. Verse 11 says, And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We saw these same concentric circles of worship in Revelation 5. Again, at the center is the throne, and there is the Lamb. And around the throne and the Lamb are the four living creatures and the elders. And then around them is another circle made up of all the angels, which we're told in Revelation 5.11, number myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Remember, a myriad was the, it was the uh, highest number in Greek. And, and this made myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands an impossible number. It's like in, a, in English when we say a zillion. You don't even know what that means. And so great a multitude of the redeemed was present, it says that no one could number them. And surrounded by this great multitude, or, or surrounding this great multitude here, we see this angels that no one could number. And so we have people without number, angels without number, and all the angels, along with all the elders and the four living creatures, they're falling down on their faces before the throne, and they are worshiping God with this sevenfold blessing of praise, ascribing to him all the worth that is due his holy perfection and his name. And it begins and it ends with the words amen, which is a word that simply means, it's transliterated right from Hebrew into Greek, and it means this is a strong affirmation of what is stated. Yes, absolutely, truly, all this. Yes, truly, all that. We want to bookend it. This is who he is. You see, the worship of God is loud and thunderous. Why? Because he's God who saved us. He is God who saved us. This is an amazing scene. And so quickly, 
We lose sight of it. We fail to remember who it is that we worship. I mean, it, it, this is why on Sunday morning we have a call to worship. and We, we hear God's word and it says, set aside everything else. This is the business of God now. We're here to worship him. Be present. Be ready. Stand at attention. Ready to give your honor and your glory and your praise to him. I don't understand when people wander in late to church. If you think I'm singling you out, well, good. If God the Father descended into this place and sat on a throne, and we said at 9 a.m., he will speak and separate us out from everyone else, and we will worship him. You would not dare walk in at 9.05. If you came to work late every week, you'd get fired. Do we really honor our employer more than God? Does that bother you? Does it upset you I'm saying that? I don't care. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to point you to the God who is worthy of your praise. He has saved you. You don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to be saved. You and I deserve to perish for eternity apart from God in hell. And he saved us. And he requires of us that we worship and honor him as the one who saved us. Perhaps the reason we do not take worship serious is because we are not serious about our salvation. If you're not serious about your salvation, maybe you should go home and contemplate what your life would look like if God turned his back on you this day. If you were left into a cold, heartless world of indifference from God. He's invited you in. We worship him for this. Then one of the elders addressed me, and he said, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and where have they come from? So this elder is now going to interpret for John what he's seen. Remember, these are one, this is, there are 24 elders that are around the throne. We saw them back in Revelation 4. They represent the entire people of God throughout history. This is the elect of the Old and the New Testament. This is the true Israel of God. And just like one of the elders interpreted things for John in Revelation 5, one of them does it again here. This time he does so through means of asking a question. Who are these clothed in white robes? Where have they come from? He's referring to the great multitude that's clothed in white in verse 9. And John says, sir, you know. In other words, John says, I don't have any idea who these are. He doesn't know, but the elder does. And this is just like what we read in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 3, two days ago. He said, can, can, these, dry, can these dry bones live? And what does Ezekiel say? Sir, you know. It's the same thing. There's an illusion. He said, the elder these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The word coming is a present middle participle, which is referring to something that's just ongoing and continuous. It's in the present, and it just keeps happening. So notice then, in the present, and when was the present? Prior to the sixth seal being opened, this great multitude clothed in white are the ones that are coming out of, in the present tense, the great tribulation on earth, and they're entering into heaven where they arrive, they are safely at home, they are in the presence of God, and at that time, they were doing so, and they were continuing to do so. Now, remember, John is writing chapter 7 when? It's taking place in the midst of chapter 6, just prior to the opening of the sixth seal. And here the elder refers to these particular worshipers as who? The ones coming out of the great tribulation, meaning in the present, meaning in the first century, meaning prior to A.D. 70. That means that when John says the great tribulation, he is not speaking about something thousands of years in the future. No, he is speaking of something happening right there. 
So it shouldn't surprise us then to find that the only other use of the phrase, the great tribulation, in the whole Bible is in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. So let's look again at Matthew 24. And remember, the subject that Jesus is addressing in Matthew 24 is the coming destruction of the temple. And I want you to look at what he says in verse 34. Matthew 24, verse 34. He says, Truly I say to you, this generation, the generation made up of the yous that truly he is saying something to, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So, everything he said above verse 34 will occur in the generation alive at that time, the people he was speaking to, which is why he commanded them to flee to the mountains in verse 16, because they would be alive and capable of fleeing to the mountains when those events happen. Now look at verse 21. For then, for then, there will be a great tribulation. Great tribulation, there's the phrase such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. Mark doesn't use the exact same phrase, great tribulation, but he says something similar in Mark 13, verse 19, referring to the same Olivet Discourse, destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, when he says, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. The great tribulation being referred to in Revelation 7, 14 was the same one Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 24 and the same one that he spoke of in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 when he said the hour of trial was about to come on the whole world to try those who dwell in the land of Israel. So, the great tribulation has already occurred. It occurred during the first century, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. It is not something that will occur in the future. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that the church, even you and I, will not face in our life tribulation and suffering and persecution, perhaps even martyrdom, but it won't be the great tribulation that is talked about in Matthew 24 and Revelation 7 because that great tribulation has already occurred. Once again, remember, John is writing to who? He is writing to give comfort and encouragement to the Christians alive at that time. The scene in verse 14 uh, does just that. What it does is it looks, we're back in Revelation, verse 14. It lets them know that those who died during this period of time don't need to be worrying. Why? Because look, they are going to join the great multitude before the throne. It's a multitude who has washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, meaning this is the multitude of the redeemed. They stand before the throne, not not on account of their own righteousness, but on account of Christ's righteousness because he shed his blood for them and he redeemed them. He washed away the filth of their sin and that's why they now have white robes. Verse 15, therefore, therefore, because of that, they are before the throne of God. They are in the presence of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. That means without ceasing. They never stop worshiping him. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. In other words, they are forever protected by God. No more temporary protection. It is permanent and lasting. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. This is an allusion to Isaiah 49, verse 10, uh, set in the context of God's uh, promise of restoration for his people. And here what it means is, is the absence of suffering and hardships that were found on the earth. Once in heaven, those suffering and hardships that they experience on earth, they come to an end. They're gone. They're done forever. Verse 17, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. As the church enters into heaven, having overcome this great tribulation, they not only leave behind the hardships of earth, 
but they are completely restored and refreshed by the Lamb. It's Jesus who guides them to springs of living water. And all these tears of grief are now replaced by tears of joy and relief because they've come out of the tribulation and they left behind all the hardships of the earth. And God wipes away every last tear from their eyes. This is one of the most tender images in the entire Bible. And it serves to comfort and encourage every one of us, and no matter if we're these people or us, to patiently endure and to overcome. And the reason is because one day we too are going to enter into the multitude of the redeemed in heaven. And our tears of grief are going to be replaced by tears of relief and joy on that day. And God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. This interlude of chapter 7, it serves such a powerful purpose for its first century audience because they were about to face, as it says in Revelation 3, the hour of trial that was about to come upon the whole world. And it answered the question for them, well, what's going to happen if Jerusalem falls? What's going to happen to the church? And I want you to turn one more time to Matthew 24. I want you to look at one last thing. Turn to Matthew 24 and look at verse 9. And I just want you to remember that when Jesus spoke of the coming destruction of Jerusalem in the Olivet Discourse, he told his followers something very significant about this coming tribulation. In Matthew 24, verse 9, he says this, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, and they will put you to death. That doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? They'll put you to death. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. In Revelation 7, the great multitude that no one could number is gathered before the throne. And it is made up of those who endured to the end. Those who were hated and put to death, had family members turn against them. But they endured. They made it to the end because no amount of suffering, no amount of persecution or martyrdom could ever stop the advance of the church and its gospel. No amount whatsoever. And this is because Jesus had said to his followers, clearly in Matthew 16, that he promised them he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The question for John's original audience was this. If Jerusalem falls... What will happen to the church? Is this whole thing going to stop? Is it going to come to an end? So, okay, so you're going to save a remnant out of Israel. What about the promises to Abraham that all the nations of the earth will worship him? Now, let me show you the rest of the story. John, turn your eyes from there. You You see me protecting them? Look back, John. Look to the throne. What do you see? Who's there? Oh, my Lord, I I can't even count them. Where are they from? Everywhere. What language they speak? All the languages. What tribes? All the tribes. How many are? I don't know. I can't number them. Try. It's beyond number. What do you see? I see it beyond number. A a multitude of redeemed. It's, It's incredible. What do you hear? I hear singing, loud voices crying out to God. You know what I hear, Lord? I hear angels 
beyond number, joining these saints beyond number. They're singing, Lord. They're singing. What are they saying? They're saying salvation belongs to our God. Why? Because he saved them. Did you see all the stuff happening on earth that was stopping that? Well, I saw they hated all those people. They killed them. They put them to death. Their families turned on them. Did it stop the gospel? Obviously not, Lord. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Well, how do you think this happened? Because they kept killing them. They kept stopping the the, the gospel. Didn't they keep stopping the church from spreading? Well, no, Lord. They couldn't do that. Why? Well, because Jesus said he would build his church. And the gates of hell would not prevail against it. You mean that Jesus said that he would advance the church right past the gates of hell and nothing would stop it? Yes. And did he do it? Yes, obviously. Look, there they all are. If Jerusalem falls, what will happen to the church? The booming answer that comes from the throne of heaven is clear. If Jerusalem falls, the church will still triumph. It will not be stopped. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all nations to the whole world, and then the end will come, and it will result in a great number of people being saved, so many that no one can number them. And friends, we must not Forget this in our own day. You and I cannot forget this. We cannot forget. We must not be so foolish as to sit around biting our nails, asking foolish questions like, whoa, what if we lose our freedom? What if America falls? What if we're persecuted? What's going to happen to the church? These things have no impact. No impact whatsoever on the ultimate triumph of the church. Christ reigns. Christ reigns. And he will continue to reign. And there is nothing that will stop the spread of the gospel. Nothing. Nothing will stop its power to accomplish the saving of a great multitude that no one can number. Listen, sit right where you are right now and say to yourself, Jesus promised he would build his church. Nothing can stop the advancement of the gospel. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Listen to the words of Charles Spurgeon, the great Victorian preacher who once told a group of missionaries, I myself believe that King Jesus will reign and the idols will be utterly abolished. But I expect the same power which turned the world upside down once will continue to do it. The Holy Spirit would never suffer the imputation to rest upon his holy name that he was not able to convert the world. Have you ever thought about that? That the conversion of the world rests upon the Holy Spirit's reputation to do what he was sent to do? You think he'll fail? You think Jesus will fail to save those? that he died and shed his blood for? Do you think the Father will fail to save those whom he chose before the foundations of the world? Never will they fail. The entire triune Godhead will bring about the success of the gospel. You have to stop being a person who, who in pessimism gives so much credit to the wickedness of humanity and such little credit to the power of God. Oh, I look at the world and things are getting so bad. I don't see how the gospel is really going to change much. Well, you have more faith in wicked people than in the sovereign power of God to save. Write this down, engrave it on your heart, and never forget it. Jesus Christ will succeed.
Jesus Christ will succeed. In the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 and 25, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority and power because he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Friends, listen. Jesus Christ will succeed. He will succeed. Your comfort in life is this. Jesus Christ will succeed. Take comfort. He is building his church. It is made up of a great multitude from every tribe and nation and people, and no one can number it. Jesus could not be stopped in John's day. He will not be stopped in our day, and he will not be stopped in the future. Jesus Christ will succeed. And so you and I are called to press on in the confidence daily of knowing that Jesus Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do not live with a pessimistic view of the future, beaten down, constantly worried, constantly frustrated, constantly in fear. Lift your voices to the king and say to him, you will succeed. Help me to have the faith to never doubt your power. And then walk in that same power every day as a faithful witness to him, no matter what. All right, I've taken a lot of time. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> it is by your grace that we are saved. And in that same grace, we are given the power to preach your word and to share the gospel of salvation with all people on earth trusting that you will succeed. We pray we see in our day a great harvest for the kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.